Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, we're uh, here, in case you didn't know why you were here, we're here to give you guys an update on uh, chronic wasting disease. Uh, it's recently been found here in, in Henry County. Um, and so this is actually a joint informational session between TWA, uh, the University of Tennessee Extension, um, and it's uh, between uh, Henry and Weekly counties and the surrounding counties, anybody who, who's interested was invited out tonight. Um, before we get started, just to do a few introductions of folks from around the room. Um, we do have one of our commissioners from, uh, from TWA, the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission, uh, Monty Ballou is here. Where, where did he end up? Raise your hand. He's in the back. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we've got several of our county officers here. Uh, Greg Barker's here from Henry County. Uh, Brian Elkins, who's the major for uh, Region 1 out here in Western Tennessee. Uh, John Dunn from uh, Benton County. Um, Steve Brewer, also from Henry County. And our Region 1 Wildlife Program Coordinator, Patrick Lemons, is also here uh, this evening. Um, and all these folks are, will be available for uh, questions regarding CWD afterwards. Uh, we will have an, uh, the cards that are being passed around. Um, those are also for you to write your questions on, and we'll try and answer as many as we can in our question and answer session. But if we don't get them all answered during the formal uh, presentation period, there will be these folks floating around that can possibly help answer some of your questions regarding CWD. Um, I want to also introduce uh, Ransom Goodman and thank him for putting this all together. He is the uh, Henry County Extension agent here. Um, and we also have Will Gregory, who is a Weekly County um, Extension agent in the back there. I um, just want to thank those guys for helping get this set up. Um, it's always good to have a nice location like this to be able to give these kind of presentations. Um, when we do have our Q&A session, we're here to talk about chronic wasting disease and deer management here in Western Tennessee. That's uh, what we're going to limit our questions to for the formal Q&A session that we have at the end of this. So uh, just keep that in mind that that's what our focus is here tonight. Um, and then one last person, uh, Stephanie Carnes is the Assistant Wildlife Division Chief. She's also in the building tonight uh, with us. Um, and so she is over all the CWD programs that are, that are here in West Tennessee as well as throughout the state. So um, with that, I should have introduced myself. I'm Dan Grove. I'm the Wildlife Veterinarian for the University of Tennessee um, Extension. Uh, I also serve as the Wildlife Veterinarian for uh, TWA in a joint position um, between UT and, and TWA. Uh, our other presenter tonight is going to be Jeremy Dennison. He is actually the CWD field coordinator out here in Region 1. Um, and so he'll be presenting uh, uh, the other portion of our presentation tonight. So we'll actually have two, two, uh, two portions of this presentation. Normally we take a pause in between and answer a few questions. We're going to wait till the end and use these cards to answer questions just because of the number of people that we have here tonight. Um, and COVID concerns about sharing microphones and stuff, uh, we're, we've decided to go that route. So with that, we'll get started. Um, the uh, information that I'm going to cover is the basics of chronic wasting disease. What is the disease and what we actually know about the disease here in Tennessee and, and how we actually do our surveillance systems here in the state uh, and more on the science side of things as well as some of the research projects that we actually have ongoing. And then Jeremy's going to actually cover more of the rules and regulations as they apply specifically to here in Henry and Weekly County because they are a little bit different than they are in the other areas that are impacted uh, with CWD in, the, um, in West Tennessee. So chronic wasting disease, uh, you know, it's, it's just a general term for the clinical signs that we see associated with this actual infectious disease. It's caused by what's called a prion. Uh, prions are basically just abnormally shaped proteins. It's not a living organism like we think of with uh, bacteria or fungi. Uh, these are just abnormally shaped proteins that whenever they come in contact with a normally shaped protein, it makes that protein misshape, and then the body can't get rid of it. And so these abnormal proteins tend to build up in the body, um, and since the body can't get rid of it, it, it actually causes damage in the cells uh, where it builds up. Um, the primary, even though it can be found pretty much throughout the body, the primary places are in the brain. So all the signs that we see, and we'll go through those here in a little bit, are a result of the damage that's occurring in the brain. And it takes a while for this to occur. Again, we'll get into a little bit more of that. Uh, other things that you may have heard of that are related to this as an infectious disease are mad cow disease, 
scrapie in sheep and goats, and Creutzfeldt Jakob disease in people. Um, I don't want to bore everybody with a history lesson. I uh, throw these slides in just as a general informational. We recognize disease syndromes, basically the signs that we can see long before we ever know what causes them. And so the first recognized prion disease was actually scrapie, and it's been since the 1700s. CWD, although it was identified in the late 60s in northern Colorado, wasn't identified as a being a prion until the early 80s. And so really the knowledge that we have is pretty much from actually the last 20 years because until it was identified in the early 80s, there wasn't much research going on with the disease syndrome. So most of the information that we have and that we're presenting to you is information that's been gleaned just over the last 20 to 30 years. So it just kind of puts it in a time frame whereas a lot of other diseases, we've, you know, we've known about them for two or three centuries and people have been researching them for that length of time. And so there is still a lot of information that we don't know about the disease, but we have learned a lot in the, in the short time that we have known about it. CWD, like I mentioned, was first identified in northern Colorado outside of Research Pen uh, in the late 60s. Since then, uh, prior to 2000, it was identified in areas in southern uh, Wyoming and then in some captive service facilities throughout the west as well as up in Saskatchewan. Um, since then, the disease has pretty much spread, uh, and if you look at the pattern of spread as it has occurred up until we found it in 2018, there's been both man-assisted movement of the disease, because, you know, deer and elk out west aren't necessarily going to travel all the way over to Pennsylvania on their own, um, but then there's also been natural movement in the areas where it was originally found to occur, and then once it's actually occurred in new areas, the disease has kind of spread out uh, through natural movement of animals. The disease is found uh, primarily here in North America uh, is where it was first identified and still the heaviest concentrations of the disease are here in North America. But it's also been found in Scandinavia and moose in caribou populations and it was moved via captive cervids uh, in elk populations um, uh, to, uh, to South Korea in the uh, late 90s. Chronic wasting disease, primarily here in Tennessee, um, our native uh, cervid species, as we call them, are going to be our white-tailed deer and our elk. But it's also been known to infect moose, um, caribou, uh, mule deer, um, and the little critter down in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen that's actually uh, a mutt jack, which is a species of of animal from Southeast Asia. They're used in experimental research, so if you're looking online and finding articles, they're not naturally infected in the wild where they live, but they're used as an experimental model because it, they develop the disease a lot quicker. Um, so I always throw that in just because it's uh, one of those oddities um, that it's not naturally infected in those critters, but they can be infected. The disease is not known to infect anything outside the cervid family at this point in time. Um, so our cattle, our horses, sheep, goats, all of our domestic species, I get asked about llamas and things like that also. Um, experimental s studies, uh, basically, where they've co-housed the animals with infected deer and elk, um, all these domestic species, they never got the disease, even though they were co-housed with these animals. Uh, so the disease is not known to be transmissible through natural means to those species. Some experimental studies have shown that pigs can be infected. Again, those are laboratory studies. There's not ever been a pig that's been shown to have CWD in the wild that we're aware of. There is ongoing research to look at that, given that um, here in the southeast we do have feral hog populations, and so we're not really sure what the implications of that might be for those feral hogs and the ability for them to actually spread or transmit the disease. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the disease itself, the, the infectious agent, the abnormal protein, it can be found anywhere, pretty much in the body. The highest concentrations are going to be in the brain and in the lymphatic system. So basically, you know, when you go to the doctor and they feel your throat, they're feeling for lymph nodes. Um, those are the places that we primarily look whenever we're doing our diagnostic testing. Uh, but there are, the, the prions can actually be found in pretty much every excretion in the body of the animal and even in uh, uh, antler velvet. Um, in terms of the way it's transmitted, there's a bunch of different uh, theories and things that have been shown. Primarily, it's direct, through direct contact with the abnormal protein, whether that's coming in contact with a sick animal directly. Uh, deer do do mutual grooming. Uh, we do know that it's shed at rub and scrape sites. Uh, we also know that at shared feed sites, the, it's um, shed because they, you know, they urinate, defecate in the area. 
They're also drooling in that area. So there's a lot of different ways where they can uh, come in contact with the prion. And so those are more the direct routes. But once it's in the environment, these things are nearly indestructible. Um, it takes over 1,800 plus degrees Fahrenheit to destroy them. Even the hottest forest fire on record only got up to 1,400 degrees. So these things remain infectious for a long time once they're in the environment. So in an area where there's a high level of disease, the environment starts to play more of a role in the transmission cycle. You may not need deer-to-deer -deer contact to get the disease if you've got a lot of prion material out there just because the prevalence or the number of deer in the landscape that have the disease is, is at a high rate. So just something to, to keep in mind. Um, you know, we, we, the classic signs are, are kind of what we see here in this picture here. We've got an animal that's got a really poor hair coat. It's kind of bowed up. It's, uh, you can't see it as well in this image, but it's drooling. You can see every bone in its body. This is what everybody thinks of when they think of chronic wasting disease. The reality is, is I can give you about 15 other diseases that make an animal look like this. And so we cannot tell just by clinical signs alone. It gives us an idea of, yes, we want to test that animal. But the majority of animals that we actually get that test positive are actually in the preclinical phase. Typically, by the time an animal is at this point in time, they're about a month before they're dead. So it takes about 12 to 18 months before you can actually start seeing some of these outward clinical signs. You may see some subtle behavioral changes in the meantime, but before they start looking like this, you're, you're usually about 12 to 18 months down the road post-infection. So if an animal got infected today, we wouldn't actually be able to tell by looking at it that it might have a disease until next year around this time when it might start exhibiting clinical signs. Um, again, clinical signs just being that stuff that we can see with our eyes. So the really the only way we can know if an animal has this disease or another disease is actually by taking the samples that we take uh, from our hunter harvested animals, which would be lymph nodes um, and brain stem. And again, just more of what people consider as the classic images of, of sick and infected deer. You'll find them in abnormal places. The doe in the center, she's got her ears are drooped. You know, normally when a deer sees you, they park their ears up and they're listening around. You know, they'll keep their ears drooped. You know, there's something going on. And then in the far right-hand picture, um, you know, again, another deer where you can pretty much see every tendon, every bone in that animal's body, poor hair coat, in an abnormal place kind of deal. Um, so just things to – visual cues that we use whenever we're doing our targeted um, surveillance. Like if we see animals like this, these are animals we want to know about and get samples out of. Well, like I said, the majority of animals that actually test positive are apparently clinically normal animals. Um, here we've got two big, fat, healthy bucks, nice racks on them, um, good-looking animals. Both of these animals tested positive for CWD. The one on the left-hand side was actually in Wisconsin in 2011. The one on the right-hand side was one of our first uh, CWD-positive deer that was taken here in the state of Tennessee in 2018 off of one of our wildlife management areas. So we can't go just based on what the animal looks like to know if they have the disease. And both these animals, because we're able to detect it in them, were actually shedding this disease even though they look like they're clinically normal. So they'll actually start shedding these prions early on in the infection even though it doesn't look like there's anything wrong with these animals. You know, again, before I mentioned um, you know, the, the impacts of the environment. So, you know, again, bait and feed sites, any place where animals tend to congregate, whether natural congregation or man-made congregation is a place for these prions to be deposited in the environment. And if other animals visit that, it's a chance for them to be exposed to, the, to these abnormal proteins and become infected with them. There is no known treatment. In all the studies that have been done, every animal that gets it dies from it at some point in time. Um, there's this talk about resistance, and you know, there's a lot of work being done on genetics right now. Uh, resistance does not equate to immunity. So basically, resistance just means it might take a little more prions to get them infected, but they will eventually become infected, and if they do become infected, they do eventually die from the disease too. It just might take them longer. That 12 to 18 month period is extended out to potentially upwards of 36 months, which means they're actually on the landscape for longer shedding those prions and infecting other animals. So just something to um, distinguish between resistance and immunity. Uh, in terms of prevention, there's been a lot of vaccine trials that have been done. 
Uh, none of them have worked at this point in time. There are some other vaccine trials that are being conducted uh, in the U.S. and Canada right now in laboratory settings, um, but at this point in time, there is no preventative treatment uh, for this disease. The big question that's on probably a lot of people's minds here and, and in general across the U.S. where we find CWD is, is it infectious to people? If I handle this animal and I consume meat from this animal, am I going to get this disease? And the reality is the jury is still out. There's been mixed uh, animal model studies, not using human humans as, as study, but uh, primates and things like that, that are conflicting. The results of those studies are conflicting, and so we don't really know how to interpret that as to what it might mean for people. What we do know is that there are other prion diseases in animals that are potentially infectious to people. And so we defer to the human health authorities. As a wildlife agency, we, we're, it's not our place to make health recommendations, so we defer to our human counterparts for that. And so it's recommended that if you're hunting in an area that's known to have CWD, that you get your animal tested if you're concerned, and if it tests positive, do not consume meat from that animal. With that being said, you know, the disease has existed in the United States for over 50 years. There's been a lot of people that have knowingly and unknowingly consumed meat from infected animals, and there's not been a single case of human disease linked to consuming meat, but we always want to urge caution. You know, if this animal had abscesses all through it or something like that, I would never recommend that you eat that animal. So if you know an animal has an infectious disease, you know, we just generally recommend don't eat that because you don't want to run that risk or, you know, uh, you know, even feeding it to your children or, you know, your dog or things like that. We, we just advise against that, regardless of what that disease might be. It also is why we always recommend, even if you're not hunting an area with CWD, that you just take some precautions, wear gloves while you're handling and processing the deer, things like that, because there are other diseases out there that you can actually get that we know you can get um, that you might come across. So again, I just put the official stuff in here just so that it's there. Um, these are the official recommendations from the CDC, but again, if you're concerned and you're in an area that's known to have CWD, we recommend you get it tested. Jeremy will talk more about how you can get your deer tested um, in a little bit. In terms of surveillance here in, uh, in the state of Tennessee, we've had some level of surveillance that's occurred since the early 2000s. Um, in general, up until about 2015, there wasn't as much surveillance going on because uh, it wasn't found when there was intensive surveillance that was done. But in 2015, it was found in Arkansas. And so uh, we started to reevaluate the programs here in Tennessee and how we did our surveillance. And in fall of 2018, we kind of rolled out a new surveillance uh, program that basically is set at the county level. So we have goals for every county every year, um, and we have to meet those surveillance goals. And since 2018, every county in the state, we've actually met all of those surveillance goals to detect the disease if it existed there at a minimum threshold. Um, again, there's always a chance that it's below that threshold that we set, uh, but in general, we've gotten three good years of data um, out of it. Uh, and again, that's based on the risk of the disease already existing there unbeknownst to us, uh, whether it was moved in through natural movement from deer from adjacent states that had the disease, through carcass movement from out west where the disease has existed for a while, um, all kinds of different mechanisms of deer density, things like that were all, were all factored into it. We primarily get our samples from hunter harvested animals. And so either it's through direct drop off from folks like yourselves that uh, may drop them off in our freezer program, or we get it from taxidermists and processors that are cooperating in the various areas where we're, we're looking to get samples from. Uh, this map is from last year in terms of our surveillance quotas. These numbers do not, in each county, don't equate to the number of deer because we use a point system. Uh, bucks are worth more in our point system, so they're worth three points. So if you saw an area that had 90 points, we could get a total of 30 bucks and that would meet our minimum surveillance. Or um, as we go down, if you know, does are worth a little less. And so basically when you see these points, it doesn't equate to actual uh, numbers of animals, but more the likelihood of us detecting it in that particular age and sex class of that of, of white-tailed deer primarily. The areas in here that are kind of on red, uh, in the highest red area, um, again, this is from last year, are the areas where we're, we're still doing some intense, really, really intensive surveillance to kind of find where the leading edge of the disease is. We've gotten um, 
a lot of samples out of Fayette and Hardeman County, which is kind of where the epicenter is. So we don't need as many samples from there because we're kind of in monitoring phase there where we're looking at for increases in the spread within the county, but also changes in the prevalence in the county. Again, prevalence being the number of animals. If I went out and randomly tested 100 deer on the landscape, um, and we, again, this is at the county level, what number of those would actually have the disease? So if I talk about a 10% prevalence, if I go out and randomly sample 100 animals from, say, Fayette County, and that has a 10% prevalence, 10 of those deer will be positive. So when we talk about prevalence, that's how that kind of equates. Um, again, realizing that you know those are nice round numbers just to make it easier to understand. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of the numbers of, um, of our past surveillance efforts, what I mentioned before. Early 2000s, when it was first detected east of the Mississippi and Wisconsin, there was money available throughout the country uh, to, to do a lot of surveillance. And as the money faded away, surveillance mostly focused on targeted animals, so those sick-looking animals. Um, and then again, when it was found in Arkansas, uh, increased efforts uh, actually th all throughout the southeast to, to look and see um, where the disease might exist at that point in time. Um, and so again, in 2018 was our first detection in December of 2018. Uh, and then the other two, uh, two seasons since then, we've ramped up a lot. So we went from sampling about 200 deer a year in 2015. Uh, last year, we were close to 18,000 deer that were sampled. So there's, and most of those animals actually come from region one. Um, which is out here in this area. So we've actually gotten, and Jeremy will talk a, a little bit more about this, um, we've gotten a lot of samples from Henry and Weekly counties at this point in time because we've had three full years of surveillance here. Um, and so this year we're trying to increase the number of samples that we get uh, just to kind of refine a little bit more um, if the disease exists here, at what level does it actually exist. We get asked about what's going on in Mississippi all the time, so I just kind of include the numbers. Uh, keeping in mind that their hunting structure is a little different than ours, so they're not as able, able to harvest as many deer as we, uh, we do. Um, they're testing the relative amount of the deer that are harvested that we are here on the Tennessee side of things. Um, and the epicenter is definitely here in Tennessee for this, this uh, disease outbreak. In terms of prevalence, this is kind of where we were at the end of the season last year. Uh, Fayette and Hardeman is what we refer to as our core counties that have the highest prevalences. These prevalences are actually a little bit diluted, um, meaning that we're looking at it at the county level because we don't have like where all the non-detect animals were actually harvested. We only have locations from the positive animals, so we look at the county level as an easier representation. Um, but there are places within Fayette and Hardeman County that are much higher than the county level prevalence. Um, and I'll show you that here in a map in a second. Again, the core zone being Fayette and Hardeman counties, um, what we're looking at is we have actually been able to detect an increase in that prevalence in those two counties each year, um, meaning that you know the, the disease is starting to increase in those counties as we go year, year to year to year. Um, here we have a breakdown of basically uh, fawns, yearlings, and adult male, adult female. Uh, the key takeaway is we're finding here what most states have found with the disease. Adult bucks are twice as likely to actually have the disease, um, and that's why we have them ranked higher in our system uh, for for number of points for, for doing our surveillance. Um, as the disease progresses and the prevalence increases, these, these bars basically become even across the age and sex classes. Um, right now, because we are actually detecting it in our fawns, um, basically, you know, most of our fawns that we're getting are four to six months of age when we're testing them uh, through hunter harvest. It means they're getting the disease early in life. So if you only live to be 12 to 18 months old and you get the disease as a fawn, you're not likely to actually put another animal on the landscape from your genetic pool. You're most likely going to be dead before you get the chance to breed and successfully raise, if you're a doe, successfully raise a fawn. And if you're a buck, you're not likely to actually breed before you, uh, before you succumb to the disease. So that's kind of what we look at when we look at these sex and age classes is as it starts to increase, these, this is where we're starting to see the impacts on the population because if you're losing automatically a subset of your population to the disease each year, you're also not adding to your population at the same time. 
Um, I focused in a little bit on Fayette County just because the numbers are a little bit higher. Uh, if you look in the lower right-hand corner at the buck prevalence, that's just adult buck being two and a half years and older. Um, and this is countywide, keep in mind. So in, in Fayette County, it's 21% prevalence at a countywide level. And remember, that's diluted. Um, so basically, if I went out and I randomly harvested 100 bucks in Fayette County, 21 of those are going to test positive. That's a, that's a high number of animals, especially since we're only three years out from our initial detection. Most of the time you see prevalences in that 0.5% range. Like when you start getting up above 10%, it's, 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 you're almost at an exponential increase every year. So in Fayette County, you know, there's a really high prevalence within, within our different age and sex classes. So this is a heat map. Um, the areas that are kind of in the cool colors, like our blues and our purples, are where less positives have been found. Uh, the areas that are kind of in the red, um, those are where more and more positives have been found. So if you look at this, it kind of gives you an idea of where most of the positives have been found. And this is cumulative data through the end of uh, the 2020 season. Um, and so what we've actually seen is 60%, roughly 63% actually, of our positive animals come from a 500 square mile area on the Fayette and Hardeman County border. And so remember I was talking about the prevalences. If you're harvesting animals in that area, your prevalences are a lot higher. We know there's some individual property owners that have tested a lot of animals off their property. There's prevalences in adult bucks well over 50% in some of these areas. So it's just something to keep in mind that when we're talking about prevalences, it's a way for us to measure changes in movement of the disease as well as what's going on with the population. But there are gonna be different patches on the landscape that have higher or lower numbers of, of positive animals because the disease does not evenly distribute across the landscape. So I throw in some back of the napkin kind of math, just some brainstorming kind of math, just, you know, we make some assumptions. You know, we know that deer, like I said before, they're not, deer aren't evenly distributed on the landscape, we know that. And we also know that the disease isn't evenly distributed amongst the deer on the landscape. But if we assume that it was, and we just took it and looked at the county level. And this is, again, going into those prevalences and things. We know that there's a 14% countywide prevalence in Fayette County, 706 square miles for the whole county. If we're looking at 20 deer per square mile, which is a, you know, just, an, just a rough estimate kind of deal, because obviously there's going to be higher numbers of deer in some area than there are others. But if you just average it out, 20 deer per square mile, roughly 14,000 deer in the county, over 1,900 of those deer are going to have the disease at a 14% prevalence. And so when you start adding this up and you start looking at the different counties and looking at the different prevalences in the different counties, you start to realize, you know, we detected last year 635, I think, new, new cases last year. We've had 1,300 positives total since 2018 we're only getting a small subset of those animals. There's a lot more animals on the landscape that actually have the disease than, than what's actually represented in these numbers. And that's where you know continued harvest and removal of animals comes in, is that in order to get at trying to lower the number of positive animals and decrease the transmission rates, we gotta get more animals removed from the landscape. This is where we sit at this point in time. This map is more of a regulatory map. It's kind of a preview of what Jeremy's gonna talk about. Um, we distinguish things based on human geography versus rivers and things like that because some things change, but most of our units and things like that are at the county level. Um, it's also how we're doing our monitoring. So the counties that are in red are those where there's actually been a known positive in a wild animal detected. The counties in yellow, um, we we'll see these little, we draw these little circles. Anything within 10 miles of a known positive in the wild. If that falls into another county, then that county is considered a high-risk county. Because when an animal is actually harvested, we don't know that that was at the center of its home range. So we kind of take what we know is a home range for that animal and they create a buffer around that because it could have been on the very edge of its home range or you know, not exactly centered. And so we just create a little bit larger area so that whenever we're actually doing our surveillance, we're making sure that we get anywhere that animal could have potentially been. Some of the research that's actually going on, um, some of this has started, COVID has delayed some of it uh, in terms of the lab's ability to uh, do some of the work. We're looking at a vertical transmission study that was a joint study with um, TWA, uh, Arkansas Game and Fish, as well as uh, West Virginia Department of Natural Resources. 
and uh, University of Georgia, as well as the University of Tennessee, uh, looking at, we know that in elk and in mule deer, it's transferred uh, to the fawn before the fawn's born. That's never been shown in white-tailed deer, and so we're basically um, trying to prove that that is a method of transmission with that particular study. Uh, again, if you hit the ground running and you're already infected, you know, you're not going to contribute to the population as a whole, most likely. So something, that, you know, that's kind of the point of that study is to, to, to prove something. Um, in terms of optimizing our surveillance efforts, um, there's actually, I believe there's 26 states involved in this project now, uh, where we're combining all the data from essentially the western, or sorry, the eastern half of the United States. Um, everybody's surveillance data is all going into uh, a database, and we're trying to glean as much information as we can in terms of better management, better surveillance, um, what works and what doesn't work, uh, things that we can look at even at the landscape level uh, in terms of geography uh, for being able to predict the spread of the disease and, and things like that. There's a lot. I mean, we have over 40 different entities represented between universities and states on that project, and Tennessee's been involved in that project since the, the very beginning and the inception of that project. One other thing we're looking at, um, and you may have heard about this, we actually are uh, in, a, in a joint project with Colorado State University where we're actually looking at using dogs as biosensors to detect uh, infected animals out there in the landscape. Um, and where that might, you know, there's a bunch of different potentials for that, you know, having dogs at a, at a check station to let you know, hey, this animal might be positive because our testing mechanisms, there's only so much we can do to shorten that time period between getting the sample from you getting it to the lab. Uh, so far, the dogs are actually showing pretty good success at recognizing, we're, we started them on feces from known uh, infected animals, and uh, they're, they're actually doing really well with being able to detect the feces from some of these animals. We're moving through different phases where we're gonna start looking at using gut piles and things like that uh, with the surveillance dogs. Again, it's all in theory, we're just trying to prove that they can detect it. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to end up at the end of it with a program where we can actually train dogs and have them uh, be actually usable out in the field. So stay tuned on that one. Uh, we're in phase two of that project um, with that funding at this point in time. All the information that I've presented here, there's some handouts in the back if you didn't grab one. Those handouts are also available online um, and uh, different locations. Um, the extension handout is available through the extension website. TWA is the go-to source, though, for anything that's current here in Tennessee. Go to cwdintennessee.com. Um, sign up for your email updates. Apparently, you've got to go in. If you have a TWA account, you have to actually go into your account and enable it through your account uh, to sign up for those emails. So um, if, so, if some of you try to sign up and you had trouble with it, uh, there are a couple of folks that can help you with that here tonight. Um, so uh, if you would like to sign up for that and you had trouble signing up before, um, we can get you in touch with those folks. But uh, some of the other places, USDA, CDC, and National Wildlife Health Center are other places you can find uh, information relative to human health, uh, relative to prion diseases, as well as uh, where the disease exists elsewhere in the United States, as well as um, in the world. We'll not do questions here. I do have a list of references if anybody needs it. Um, and with that being said, I'll have Jeremy come up and we'll take a second here to transition in between slides. Again, uh, make sure if you have questions, write them on here and, and get them up here. Uh, or just, more cards if anybody yeah. needs one. Or uh, just Stephanie uh, is over here collecting them, so just get them to her. All right, thank you, Dan. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, it's a good crowd for one of these meetings. Uh, so I'm glad to 
Glad to see all you folks. My name is Jeremy Dennison. I've uh, been with TWRA since 2010, uh, most recently as a regional big game biologist in 2018. And then we discovered chronic wasting disease in the state. Um, so my position and my job duties have significantly changed. Uh, and so I'm known as CWD field coordinator. Um, we coordinate sampling effort and, and management activities uh, for CWD in the state. Um, I'm from Dyer County originally. I actually killed my first deer right across the bridge at uh, LBL when I was 15. Um, and now I live in Weekly County. So I'm a deer hunter. I'm a Weekly County deer hunter. Um, so I'm going to bring you the, uh, the TWRA regulation side and a little bit of the, uh, you know, as Dan mentioned, how to get your deer sampled and all the information that uh, I can provide you. <clears throat> So I always like to start with the, the three main goals of uh, CWD management for TWRA. Uh, first is to prevent or slow the spread of CWD to new areas. Um, two, to keep the number of infected deer to a minimum and then to reduce prevalence rates uh, where possible, if possible. <clears throat> so as Dan mentioned, uh, he might show uh, this map also, but this is where we stand as far as CWD positive locations for the state. Of course, we detected it in December of 2018 uh, in Southwest Tennessee, in Fayette and Hardeman counties. Um, since then, we've collected a lot of samples, a lot of information. We feel like we have a really good handle on the distribution of the disease in the state. Um, we definitely know that we have a well-defined core of the outbreak in those two high prevalence counties. Um, and of course, we've, we've detected it in a few low prevalence counties around there, sort of as uh, the buffer area. Um, and that brings us to this year. Um, follow up on sick deer reports um, a lot of times. Um, got one of those this summer that led us to um, Northwest Henry County. It was a three and a half year old doe that was exhibiting some of those symptoms that Dan described in his presentation, um, neurologic symptoms. Um, ended up, we're able to collect a sample from the deer, had it tested and uh, it came back positive. So changed uh, Henry County's designation to a CWD positive county. Um, it was within 10 miles of Weekly County, of the county line. So that changed Weekly County to high risk. And then as you probably know, it was within uh, less than eight miles of the Kentucky state line. So that enacted uh, Kentucky's CWD response plan as well. Um, so here we stand as far as the CWD affected area. Again, there are positive counties uh, where we've detected the disease and then there's high risk counties where we've detected it within 10 miles of the county border as in the case of weekly. <clears throat> um, if, in case you're interested, some of you may have may be aware of this, but our neighbors to the north, Kentucky, uh, with it being so close to their uh, state line, uh, their CWD response was enacted. So they have a five county um, surveillance zone that they're calling it. Uh, they've got transportation restrictions, feeding restrictions, um, and uh, mandatory sampling. So. We know after this deer season, uh, with the opportunities to have deer sampled um, here in Henry County, next door in Weekly County, uh, those new locations, and uh, with Kentucky collecting a lot more samples from Western Kentucky, uh, we feel like we'll have a much better um, outlook and make a, a more educated decision um, on the status of CWD and potential you know, management actions. Um, so those top four, that's where, we, that's where we obtain most of our samples. As Dan mentioned, most of our samples come from hunter harvested um, animals. So we really appreciate you guys that have submitted samples from Henry and Weekly counties uh, already. And um, I'd encourage those of you that haven't yet to, you know, please do so. Please take advantage of, um, of your processors and taxidermists that we work with. You know, we also have uh, CWD sample drop-off freezers that you might have seen throughout the county. Um, we will still be doing 
annual deer check stations as we have in the past. Uh, you may have seen us at a couple of the processors um, during the opening Saturdays of muzzleloader and um, rifle season. We'll still be there uh, this year. We'll be taking antler measurements. We'll also be taking uh, CWD samples. Um, so those four are really the, the, the major ways that we obtain samples. We also sample clinicals that we get calls about, uh, road kills, and we, we obtain samples through a few other programs, the CWD management permits and targeted removal. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. <clears throat> So uh, this is a snapshot of last year. We collected a few over 18,000 samples for the state. As Dan mentioned, every county has a, a sample uh, surveillance quota. Um, we meet that for every county in the state. Uh, almost 17,000 of those came from Region 1 or West Tennessee, and 15,000 came from the unit CWD counties, which are in Southwest Tennessee. Um, you'll notice there last year, of course, Henry County wasn't, we didn't have the um, sample sites and things worked out, but through our normal um, check stations and, and other means, we sampled 82 deer from here in Henry County and 140 uh, from Weekly. <clears throat> and you can see the 645 positive samples and the, and the breakout from each county, how that, how that breaks out. Um, and then that brings us to this year. Of course, we're early on. Uh, we've got both season going on. Um, but we were able to get most of the locations in place before um, bow season really started. So we've had those locations um, available, and uh, people are, you know, taking advantage of them. Uh, so far, for West Tennessee as a whole, we've sampled 584 deer as of yesterday for this season, and that's at least one sample from every West Tennessee county except for Lake County. Um, and we'll get there with Lake as well, so... Uh, we've got 17 positives as of yesterday, and you can see the breakout there uh, with 10, 5, 1 from Haywood, and then the one from Henry was, of course, the uh, clinical uh, from earlier in the fall. So these are the locations that I was telling you about. Um, if you go to our website, there's a really good interactive map, um, basically is what this is clipped from. Um, and it's also got really organized lists where you can find um, locations that you can work with to have your animal tested. Um, but these are the 89 uh, locations that we work with uh, to give people the opportunity to have their animal tested. We zoom in to Henry County. Of course, there's two processors right now that we're working with. A um, few taxidermists, as you see there. And then we've got four freezer locations. You guys might have seen these around town. Um, and over to, excuse me, Weekly County, um, we covered uh, Mr. Birdwell's processing, uh, David Rush taxidermy, and then we've got four freezers over there, or sorry, three freezers there in Weekly as well. And again, this is all on our website, uh, cwdintennessee.com. Um, wanted to highlight the drop-off container or the drop-off freezer locations. Um, these are specifically designed for home processors. So, you know, if you take your deer to one of the processors that we work with, they're going to save the head for us, and then we pick it up and we collect and submit the sample for you. Um, if you process your own, we want you to be able to take your the head of your harvest, take it to one of these drop-off coolers. Uh, we need you to fill out all your information on the cards that are provided. And then we provide you a bag and a zip tie and everything you need to leave it for us. Um, and we will take it from there and submit your sample for you. And one thing I'd like to remind you, as Dan mentioned, uh, the information in your real system account, um, we need to make sure that you leave us correct information on these, uh, on these carcass tags because that's the way that we uh, link your sample results and that's the way we get your results to you. So make sure we have your correct information. <clears throat> so how do I get my results? Uh, for one, with Henry County being a, a new positive county, if you happen to kill a positive deer, um, you will get a phone call from TWRA. Um, you'll also get an email notification. So again, make sure your email address is correct and your phone number is correct uh, in your account. 
You can also go on the website and search for results by confirmation number. They're listed um, with just confirmation number, date, and county. Uh, there's nothing about your name or anything like that. Um, but you can search for a confirmation number and get your results there as well. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so uh, on for the, to the regulation side of things. Um, when we detect a positive in a new county, there are, it's basically in two parts. So there's regulations that automatically are enacted. Um, those being the transportation restrictions uh, so where and how you can transport deer and deer parts and then the feeding and mineral ban. So the placement of food and food, grains, and minerals. Um, those are automatically enacted upon a positive result. Um, the second part of that are hunting regulation changes. There's been a lot of confusion. We've got a lot of, a lot of questions, understandably, um, about, you know, why is Henry and Weekly not in unit CWD? Um, the, to change a procla proclamation on a, a big game season, it requires a commission action through the season setting process. So, you know, right now, unit CWD, CWD regs do not apply to Henry and Weekly counties at this time. Um, and that's really for a, a couple of reasons. Um, first off, is when we detected the deposit, uh, the, <clears throat> when we detected CWD in the county, um, the hunting guide was already out, the seasons were set, both season had actually already started. Um, so we wanna take uh, regulation changes a year at a time because there's the potential if we change every time we detected CWD, we could change it multiple times during the season. Um, so, we want to avoid confusion of changing a season while it's ongoing. Um, also, um, we don't really know a lot about the situation with CWD in Henry County other than the one location. Um, so we're hopeful that with more information this during, after this season, you know, we'll be able to make a, uh, you know, educated recommendation. Um, on CWD management and potential regulation changes. <clears throat> so this is just a, um, it's a map showing the situation, similar situation uh, that happened in 2019 with uh, <clears throat> Crockett and Gibson counties. Those two counties were added as high risk because of a positive in uh, Northwestern Madison County. Um, you can see on the map on the left there, they were added as high risk counties. So the transportation and the uh, feeding restrictions applied, but they weren't immediately added to unit CWD. As you can see the date there is October the 3rd. So it was during uh, archery season. Um, and you'll see there the next year, 2020, uh, the unit CWD regs <coughs> uh, were applied and it was added to the uh, hunting unit. So <clears throat> this is in order to help prevent spread of the disease, there's now restrictions on how deer and deer parts can be transported um, among CWD positive and high risk counties. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through this figure. You, might, you guys might have seen this um, on your pamphlet or in the hunting guide. So when we talk about transportation rules, uh, first we need to make the distinction between approved parts and unapproved parts. So approved parts, what you see there on top, that's deboned meat, um, antlers attached to a clean skull plate, uh, clean skulls, hides, and taxidermy products. So if you're transporting those things, you can take them anywhere you want to. <clears throat> to any county, you can take them out of state. If you debone your deer, you can take your meat wherever you want to. Um, on the flip side of that are the unapproved parts, and that's the rest of the stuff. So just whole carcasses or field dressed deer, um, antlers attached to the head and all that. Um, those are what the transportation rules apply to. So for, uh, you see we have high risk, positive and unaffected CWD counties. Um, 
So you you can't take a whole deer out of Henry County into basically any county that surrounds it as it is as it stands right now. Um, Weekly County on the other side, they could bring a deer, a whole deer, um, into a positive county, into another high risk county, but not into Obine or Carroll. Um, all right, the uh, the other. Uh, regulation that is automatically enacted is the feeding and mineral restrictions and again that's to help prevent the spread of CWD um, so wildlife feeding and mineral restrictions apply to all positive and high-risk counties and that's regardless of the hunting unit so it's illegal to place grain or other food products uh, that are meant to be consumed on the ground there's, ex there's exceptions uh, for these for agricultural practices and then for feeding wildlife, um, you know, in your yard within 100 feet or so of your house. Um, same applies for adding minerals to existing mineral sites. Uh, it's unlawful to add new minerals or salt. Um, you don't necessarily have to, or legally you don't have to cover up um, old mineral sites. Um, but it is unlawful to add to those. Food plots are not affected by this regulation. Um, the a recommendation is, if you can avoid it, to avoid planting smaller food plots um, so that you don't um, concentrate deer further. Uh, but food plots are still perfectly legal to, to use. <clears throat> All right, a couple of other programs that, that are available. So if you happen to kill a buck in Henry County or Weekly County or any county in Tennessee, um, regardless of what hunting unit it's in, if you use one of your two statewide buck tags and it comes back positive, you can actually replace that buck. And again, you see there underlined, um, you'll be harvested in a unit CWD county or in the county where it was harvested, basically. So anywhere in the state, if you happen to kill a positive buck, you can replace it. Uh, new this year, if you happen to kill a positive buck and not get your results until later in the season and you're not able to cash, basically cash that in, um, or you may get your results after the season is actually closed, um, you can actually uh, roll those over to the next year. Uh, another program we have that, that also applies here in Henry and Weekly County, the Harvest Incentive Program. Um, if you happen to um, harvest a positive animal, if you get a positive notification, um, we're also going to send you a $75 processing voucher um, just as an incentive to you know keep hunting, keep using your processor. Um, it's, a, it's available to redeem at a participating processor, so ask yours if, uh, if they're participating with this. Um, it's not uh, available to go cash in and get $75 off of them, so, um, but it's just to incentivize you to continue to harvest deer and continue to utilize your processor. Um, also, residents who kill two or more CWD positive deer will receive an annual sportsman's license. Um, so that's another part of the uh, harvest incentive program. And then if you do happen to kill two positives, get the license, but you have a uh, lifetime license, you can actually gift that to anybody of your choosing. Um, same with the processing voucher. If you happen to process your own, uh, you're obviously free to use it for a processor or you can give it to someone else. Uh, there's a couple of landowner programs that we utilize as far as CWD management. Um, we do have CWD management permits that are available. Those are available to landowners in uh, Fayette and Hardeman counties. Um, and also within three miles of any positive location in other counties. Um, this basically just allows for um, uh, the take of additional deer after deer season. Um, and also target removal is another program that we've used. Um, I want to stress that it's with landowner permission only, um, but it's a targeted effort, um, TWRA, and specifically with the USDA Wildlife Services uh, to remove deer 
that are close to um, spark locations, which are locations that we found that are kind of around the, the fringe or on the, on the edge of the uh, distribution. But it's a very targeted um, approach on specific areas uh, three miles around, uh, within a three mile buffer of uh, each of those outer positives. So <clears throat> how can you help? I want you guys to feel um, like you're part of the solution here because like I said, most of our information that we have comes from hunters. Um, so for one, please continue to hunt and harvest deer. You know, harvest your bag limit. Um, no reason to, uh, to do anything different um, other than, you know, adhere to the transport and feeding restrictions and please submit your deer for testing. You know, it's recommended that if you hunt in a CWD positive area or county, um, you have your deer tested. So we hope that you will. Um, please utilize the locations that, uh, that, I, that I've shown on, on the map. And again, those are available um, on our website, cwdintennessee.com, or the CWD page at the TWRA website at tn.gov. And that's all I have. Um, for my presentation, I think now if uh, we're wrapped up with collecting questions, I think we can take a few. Uh, if we could, can we get the lights back up for the center of the room here, please? Thanks. Okay. We'll kind of go back and forth. Um, Jeremy's going to handle most of the regulatory type questions as the TWA representative. And I'll try and handle some of the science questions behind, like, the disease, because we've gotten a kind of a mixed bag of, of questions here. Um, actually, where's that? I, had a, I have a fairly long one to start with, so. Um, CWD, and then again, this is, this is a, in question format here. CWD can cause a decline in population and negative shift in age structure. Uh, if goals are met to... Um, drastically increase the harvest rate. Uh, it may slow the spread, but would the increased harvest not also perpetuate the same negative impacts as CWD itself? Uh, basically meaning would lower deer numbers uh, affect your and alter your age structure? Uh, in the short term, yes. You know, that's, that probably is an artifact of removing even more animals from, um, from the population. The reality is, is that in a lot of places, we have actually higher than we need in a given area anyways. Um, with CWD, though, the environmental impacts of it, if you let the disease go unchecked, you're not going to have deer. You're not going to be able to recover from it. So if you have an increased harvest, you can always recover, and that age structure may rebound at some point in time. But the impacts of the disease are such that that population will never recover from that because you've got that environmental component. So, like, even if we, you know, we're able to find a, a, an even balance at some level, animals are going to continue to be reinfected, and then you're going to see these cycles up and down, where it's just basically, um, in some places, it potentially could lead to what we call an extirpation or a complete collapse of the of the population itself within a given area to where there are no more deer. And every time a deer comes back in, because the environment is an is an impact that new deer would be infected even if you brought deer in or if deer migrated in of their own accord. So there is a give and take with, with trying to do management of a disease. Yes, there are negative impacts, but it's a matter of if the prevalent gets so high, the population can't recover on its own. But if you are altering just if we didn't have a disease and you were to do the same mechanisms, that population will recover within five to 10 years time. But in the impacts of the disease are that they potentially are never gonna recover from the disease. So hopefully I answered that one. Looks like the long one. I'm going to do the short one. There you go. <laughs> Can you get your deer head back after testing? I'm sorry I didn't mention this in more detail, but yes. If you want to do a European mount on your deer, um, the 
you can take it to your processor. Uh, he's saving heads for us. If they're saving heads for us at the processor, we would pull those on site. We've also got a taxidermist that specializes in, in, Europe, in uh, European mounts, um, Mr. J. They can pull it. He can pull it while you wait. He's also listed. Um, he was on the map there. He's listed on our website as a location. Um, if you drop it off in one of the freezers, though, I can't guarantee that you'll get it back. So the best way to do it, if you want to save your head for a Euro mount, is to either leave it at your processor and he'll tag it that that you want the head back, or take it to a taxidermist that does European mounts. Then that's no problem. You good? You yeah, I'll go ahead. And I've actually got two that are related to another disease. Um, we throw around a bunch of initials for diseases, and sometimes they get mixed up and jumbled together. So chronic wasting disease is the prion disease. You probably have heard about hemorrhagic disease or EHD, um, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, also known as blue tongue. Um, hemorrhagic disease, which is different than everything we've discussed tonight, is actually caused by a virus and is in, in of one of two virus groups. It's either EHDV virus, which is epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus, or blue tongue virus. And so those are completely, they're completely different mechanisms by mechanism of spread. Um, hemorrhagic disease, the virus group, can only be spread by biting midges, not direct contact of deer. Uh, um, when we see outbreaks, we see big outbreaks about every three to four years with hemorrhagic disease, the virus group that causes that. Populations actually tend to rebound and they develop actually true immunity, some populations do to that. Uh, we do see signs of it at some level every year. Uh, we see a lot of deer that come in with uh, what we call fever lines in their hooves where they just have like these sharp ridges in their hooves and it's usually indicating that while that portion of that hoof was growing, they were infected with some sort of a virus and were running a fever. Um, and so they, populations, that disease has existed here in the southeast uh, probably for you know at least 60 or 70 years, if not longer, and it'll ebb and flow with, with the populations. Um, that one is also the transmission cycle is stopped when the midge dies off. So if we, our first couple of hard freezes of the year actually kill the midge off, and so it'll actually stop the cycle. Uh, you know, as we get less and less of those hard freezes though, there is a potential for that disease transmission cycle to be year round, potentially here in the Southeast. Other portions of the United States that have it, um, that disease uh, basically stops as soon as you get those first hard freezes. Um, I had another one on here, but I'll, I'll wait. It wasn't rel relative to that. Uh, I'll cover this a little bit, uh, hopefully during my presentation, but I'll go back over it. Why is Henry County not listed as CWD unit? I'm assuming that's the unit CWD hunting regs. And again, you know, we take hunting regulations uh, with, especially with this disease, one whole year at a time. So we want to avoid changing season dates or weapons that are uh, legal to use. We want to avoid changing any of that uh, during an active season. Um, also, you know, the, as we described a little bit about them, the unit CWD hunting regs are really designed to um, hopefully reduce the population somewhat to try to uh, reduce the prevalence rates. And um, as I said in my presentation, we don't really know the full picture of CWD in Henry County, so uh, we don't really know if that's uh, warranted or, or necessary for Henry County. And hopefully after this year, we'll have a better um, understanding of where we're at. So. Um, so one of the other questions uh, relative to hemorrhagic disease and CWD was which kills more deer. If you look at CWD, a deer could be infected at any point in time, but it's going to take 12 to 18 months for that deer to die off. So you're not necessarily going to see a bunch of dead deer all at once. With hemorrhagic disease, because it's associated with the life cycle of that midge, when that midge is exploding, it, it actually breeds in mud. So like when we get a really wet spring and then kind of it dries out and we've got the mud exposed on the banks of the small streams and things like that, that creates a life cycle for that midge to just explode. So we'll see a bunch of dead deer all at once because they are running a fever. They tend to go to the water, which then they get infected at the water and even other deer. Basically it just creates this because deer are going there if we're in a drought situation because there's not water around. Um, so in a given small space of time, you're likely to see more dead deer from hemorrhagic disease, but over time, the negative impacts on the population with chronic wasting disease 
are way worse just because animals for, can recover from hemorrhagic disease but not chronic wasting disease. Mm -hmm. So not every animal that gets infected with hemorrhagic disease, the virus group, dies from that disease. And they'll pass some of that immunity on to their young. With CWD, every animal that gets infected dies from the disease. So just a little bit of the distinction. Um, in terms of, I had a question here, and this is probably one for you, but it was on one of my cards because there's multiple. So, uh, turnaround on test results. Okay, yeah. Uh, turnaround time right now, uh, she plans for about two weeks. Um, as the season progresses and we get more and more sample volume that we're sending to the lab, that could stretch out to three or four weeks potentially. Um, it just comes down to a, uh, a volume issue really with the lab stores. I can, I can tell you that if you drop a head at a processor or in one of the freezers over the weekend, um, which is when is where most people are hunting, um, we'll get those first thing Monday morning and those go uh, via FedEx to the lab by Tuesday afternoon, 100%. Uh, so we do not hang on to them and we try to, um, you know, minimize the turnaround time with everything that, uh, that we can possibly control. Yep. Um, this next question, we actually get it a lot. Uh, and it's more, of, you know, I'm going to turn it into a home gardening type thing. Would it be safe to eat turnip greens or any vegetable, for that matter, out of my garden uh, that deer have been grazing on if they're coming in and kind of hitting on your garden? Again, CWD is not known to be in infectious uh, to people. Um, if you wash your fruit or your veggies and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have some mechanical removal of all that. I'd be more concerned about if they were urinating and defecating on it and the bacteria that may be coming out of that than I would be of, of the prions potentially. Um, the other thing is if you, if you do have an area you can fence it off. I'd, I'd recommend fencing it off here if you're ultimately concerned. Um, there's not been that much study in is that a transmission route even to deer. Um, so I can't even speak as to whether or not, you know, not knowing that it is infectious to people. Uh, that it would be so we always recommend you if you're got wildlife in your garden either try and keep them out of your garden or make sure you're definitely cleaning everything before you eat it and consume it all right i got a four part question here um let me pick a few of these um first one will we be contacted only if the submitted deer is positive and i probably wasn't clear um you'll get an email notification um either either if it's positive or not detected, but you'll definitely be contacted uh, if your deer does not test positive. If it was able to be sampled. What's that? If it was able to be sampled. Yes, if it was able to be sampled. There's, there's a small subset of animals that if they're headshot and it goes through the samples that we need, even though you turn it in, the sample may no longer be there. Yeah. And so there's a very small percentage of animals that, that can't be tested because the tissue isn't there anymore. Well, I'll tell you, if we get one like that, that we're trying to pull the sample and we can't because of it being headshot. If I have your information on that on that card, we will give you a call and let you know that we weren't able to sample it for whatever reason. Um, yeah. So something to keep in mind if you're out there doing your, you know, you, you wounded it, avoid taking the headshot if you're <laughs> coming up on it. Um, what samples we take are actually right at the voice box um, or at the base of the skull if we can't get the lymph nodes from right behind the voice box, we're taking a sample out of the brain. So just keep that in mind, you know, if you're, I know it's, <laughs> it's easier said than done, right? But, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. If you are right next to it, choose a different shot uh, if you're doing like a kill and shot. With that, I mean, the, the instructions are on the top of the freezers, but um, when you cut the head off, leave us, leave us three or four inches of the net so that you make sure you don't cut through the area that we need to accept the sample from. Um, take a couple more of these. Uh, what do other states such as Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, etc., do to control CWD? Um, Dan, this may be a better one for you, but I, I do know that most states adopt the AFLA best management practices. Um, most states adopt some version of transportation rules and feeding rules, um, and there's various um, methods as far as management schemes as far as reducing population. Is there anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if you're, I guess it, sometimes it's hard to understand the intent of what somebody's question was, so I'll just kind of ramble on a little bit. Um, if, the, if the intent is to understand their regulations for transport and stuff, we recommend if you're going and hunting in one of those states, you got to look at our, it's an import thing then. So our regulations are what's going to dictate what you can and can't bring back in. 
if you're hunting here and going there with something, you need to look at their state regulations as to what you're allowed to bring into their state. So that's one thing to look at. In terms of the populations, uh, things are managed differently in the West because for one, they have different species. Um, a lot of those Western states, it's primarily in mule deer and, and to a lesser extent in white-tailed deer. Uh, the numbers of deer on the landscape are different. Their hunting structure is different. Uh, so the way just even the deer in the absence of the disease are managed is managed completely different. So it's kind of hard. It's, it's, it really is like an apples and oranges comparison of management techniques because of the difference in the species as well as um, just the deer densities and things like that. And Stephanie, who used to work in Colorado, can give a little bit more in on that. I previously worked in North Dakota and our hunting structure was completely different than here and so our management was geared a little bit differently, but again, it was that increased take and increased opportunity. Yeah, um, so universally, um, the best management practices for population level strategies to reduce the prevalence and stop the spread are decreasing population size and decreasing the age structure of the buck, buck population. And that's what no one wants to hear. That's, that's everybody's least favorite idea, is decreasing the quality of a deer herd. But unfortunately, just like Jeremy and Dan have told you, um, bucks have about twice the prevalence of does. And because they move over such m larger areas and they interact with more animals, they spread that dis the disease more readily between them. And so, um, as Jeremy mentioned, um, he, he talked about the ACWA, best management practices. That's actually um, a consortium of state and wildlife, state wildlife agencies. It's the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And they have worked to um, consolidate all of the literature, all of the things that all the different states have been trying to do to manage the disease. And so their best management practices are outlined in a 120 page document. But when it comes to management strategies, it really does come down to decrease the size of the population and decrease the age structure. And that will contribute to the sustainability of the populations long term, even though it doesn't look like a trophy herd anymore. Um, we still have the deer as a resource and it's a healthy and sustainable population. So I'm the unpopular one that gets to bring that up. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, I'll switch, switch gears a little bit. For those who uh, don't have access to areas to hunt, uh, but choose to process their own game, um, how do you recommend disposing of the carcass? Our general recommendation is, if you have the opportunity is to, to bury the unused parts or dispose of it in your normal waste stream that you would um, um, from your home. Because um, ultimately what we're trying to do is, because these things remain infectious even after the animal dies, they don't keep reproducing after the animal dies. It takes a live animal to make more of these but they are infectious after the animal dies. And, and so we recommend anything you can do to make them no longer potentially be available to another animal. And the easiest thing is burial. We also, it also kind of leads into one of the other questions that I had, so I'll just kind of keep rambling if you're cool with that, Jeremy. Um, got a question about soil types. Different types of soil will actually bind these prions and keep them from moving into the water table. We've got a lot of clay. Clay is one of the main things that actually binds these prions um, depending on the, t the clay makeup, sometimes it actually will make it a little bit less infectious. Um, but uh, other times, basically what the benefit of the clay is, is that it keeps it moving in the water table. Uh, most of the studies that have actually been done with the different soil types, the, you know, if they leave a carcass lay on the landscape and rot, the prions don't move much further than the clay that they bind to unless that clay is then washed off the surface. And so that's the key thing with getting these things into the ground is like you can get that surface runoff if we got a flood or something, but if it's buried in the ground, those animal carcasses aren't going to move. That soil that those prions are bound to is not going to move if it's buried in the ground. Um, we are, uh, you know, the other, because basically the only two, and we didn't get into it too much, ways to actually destroy the prion are through the high heat that I mentioned um, and chemical denaturing. And, you, there's no way to chemically denature something in the environment because as soon as you like pour concentrated bleach out, it's inactivated because of all the other things that are in the soil. Um, so it, it's all contact time in order for those kind of mechanisms to work, which for us, whenever we're cleaning and sanitizing in a laboratory setting, we can use those chemicals. 
but realistically, other than cleaning your own tools and stuff at home, there's not an option for doing anything in the environment at this point in time, which feeds back into if we can keep the environmental contamination down by keeping the prevalence low, you know, eventually the science will catch up and we will hopefully have some sort of something we can do in the environment to uh, inactivate those prions in the environment. So right now, these are our techniques that we have available to us and we're, we've got to prevent the buildup of those prions. So. All right. Next question is, why does it take two weeks for a test result to turn and what to do with the meat until then? I think I hit on a little bit of the turnaround time issue. Uh, you know, do you try to uh, make it as fast as possible and everything that we can control in the process? We do uh, utilize in-state laboratory for testing now. Um, so that potentially uh, helps us to speed it up some or keep it, keep it manageable. Um, on the second part of that, what to do with the meat until then. So that's one of the things, um, you know, it's up to you. If we recommend that you wait um, until you get your test results. And then of course, if it's positive, don't consume it. So, you know, if you do uh, dispose of your meat at that point, what the processing voucher is for to hopefully uh, cover your next harvest. Um, I would, me, I would uh, save processed meat, you know, that's labeled with confirmation number so that you know what's what in the freezer. Um, for me, I, I process my own deer at home, um, like probably a lot of you do. So um, what I'm gonna do is uh, debone everything, like I'm gonna process it, uh, just save it in the freezer if I have to. Um, and then finish it up when I get test results. Um, uh, there was one off of Facebook, uh, and I covered it a little bit, but I'll, I'll hit on it again. Can you vaccinate the deer? And again, there's um, the vaccines that have been looked at, they're not effective at this point. Actually, one of them that they looked at in elk actually made the elk more likely to get the disease and die from the disease by being vaccinated. So that vaccine is the opposite of what you want. Um, but again, there are, I know, I mean, I can tell you um, from being tied in with some of the research networks, there's some Canadian groups that are looking at, at that as an aspect. Um, and then there's also some American uh, groups that are looking at, at potentially developing a vaccine. You know, we've heard a lot about vaccines in the last year, and I'm not going to get into all the politics of the other vaccines. That, but in general, what we're actually talking about is just an abnormal protein, right? And so you're, when you have an immune response, you're asking your body to recognize something as foreign. And normally, like if your body, and this kind of feeds into one of the other questions that I had, normally when your body makes an abnormal protein, it breaks it down right away and reuses those components. You know, at a, at a microscopic level, it's reusing those components, those amino acids, it breaks it down into that, reuses them to make something else, because there's a checking process that occurs. These abnormal proteins, though, they bind so tightly, there's nothing in the body that can actually break it down, right? And so then the body has to actually recognize that as foreign. And the body doesn't recognize these as foreign because they're just an abnormal version of what already exists in the body. So the body doesn't do anything with it. So trying to create an immune response to that, you're basically telling the body to, to destroy itself in the process. And so, you know, like I... When it comes down to vaccines, it's, yeah, I wouldn't hold, don't hold your breath at this point in time because there's a, a lot more money being spent on other things other than developing treatments and vaccines and stuff for, for chronic wasting disease, unfortunately. We got a couple questions that are kind of similar about taking, removing antlers from a deer when dropping them off and um, why do you need to cut the antlers off for double safety before just taking glands? Um, Basically, if you want to keep your antlers to use for rabbit hunting antlers, um, please cut them off. We actually prefer you to cut them off uh, before they go in the freezer because one, we can't guarantee you that you get them back to you. Um, or somebody else may grab them and cut them off and take them with them. Um, also, if it gets super busy and there's a lot of deer in there, it takes up more space um, in the freezer. So um, yes, please, please take your uh, antlers with you when you drop them off. Uh, another, another one that's kind of related is for taxidermy purposes, how does a buck's head have to be transferred? Um, and that depends on where your taxidermist is. Um, so to, to, uh, to cross the county line from a positive county, um, if you want to get that deer mounted, it has to be um, 
antlers attached to a clean skull plate. Um, so you have to leave the brain, the head, and all that uh, behind. So um, I would suggest contacting your taxidermist if he or she is outside of the city of Lee County. Um, most of them have some way of, of coming to you or they a lot of them make arrangements with processors that are inside of the city of Lee County. Um, I know the processor in um, uh, Cooper County, Mr. Burwell, he's got a couple that he works with and I'm sure if some of these guys up here in Henry County are the same. So uh, contact your taxidermist and see if you can work out a, uh, him, him to come to you. So. Um. I have another, uh, this one, um, are GMOs and chemical sprays uh, have any uh, link to CWD? Um, given that other prion diseases existed long before we even had modern agriculture, my answer to that would be no. Um, it, it, we do know that there's a genetic mal misformation that occurs in some animals that leads to this um, there's actually old age changes that, as again, it's just a protein that as the body starts to misproduce things, we know that there's uh, forms of that. So there isn't any link to that at this point in time. Um, and it, it, I'm not going to say ever that there's never a link to anything like that. Um, if there is, it would have had to have existed back in the 1700s when they first identified scrapie. Uh, it wasn't identified as a prion disease then, but... The syndrome has been known since then, and so uh, just given what we know, um, it's a, it's an exposure to other prions that has actually probably led to deer getting this. So prion from another species potentially um, led to the crossover is, is the current theory at this point in time, but we may never know, actually. Uh, the next question says, if Henry County is positive, then why can we not get replacement bucks? And I think that was... Uh, covered in the presentation actually the replacement buck program where if you use one of your two statewide buck tags um, and it comes back positive then you do get uh, you do get to replace that tag and that's not tied to any county uh, or any hunting uh, unit specifically so if you're if you harvest a positive buck in Henry County then you do get to replace that yeah in terms of the rules and regulations uh the easiest way to look at it is the only thing that's not available to you in these counties that are now designated as, as positive and, um, and high risk that are outside of quote unquote unit CWD is uh, the Erna buck is not available currently and the extended rifle season are the only two things that aren't available to you. All the other incentive programs are currently available to you. Can we take another one? Um, some Amy, do you have any others? Uh, a couple of these are. I think I can combine these. Uh, one was yeah, out of state hunters, what to do, uh, people from other counties, what to do, and what about transporting from Stewart County to Henry County? Yeah, so one, that um, you can transport a deer from Stewart County into Henry County. So you can transport into a positive county uh, from either, from any of the counties that surround Henry. Um, to go the other way, is where the transportation rules uh, come to play. So if you're an out-of-state hunter or if you're out of the area, say if you go to Dyer County, um, you'll need to either use a processor that's inside Henry County, um, that's the easiest way, or if you, uh, so you process your own, you will need to debone your harvest and leave the, uh, leave the bones and the, the head and the, all that stuff behind. No. I do have one uh, last question here that I that I was given. Um, why hasn't TWA been testing deer depredation deer over the last 15 years? Um, I'll speak to the last three years because prior to that I was I was not here. Um, basically, we get most of our samples that we need for our monitoring and our surveillance. Again, surveillance being our ability to detect the disease in an area where it's not known to exist. And then um, uh, monitoring being where we know it exists, looking at the changes in prevalence and, and spatial spread of the disease. We get all that from our hunter harvested animals. Um, so basically it's just additional costs and things like that to give us not much more data than what we're already collecting um, since we have our new surveillance uh, scheme in place. Now, if there's an individual landowner that is interested, there are options that we can discuss 
uh, for getting those animals tested. That, that is potentially available, but there may be some cost to the landowner, which is why if people want to know what happens on their own property, we highly recommend you harvest those animals as much as you can during season and submit it through the, the normal process of, of getting those animals tested. A lot of times out of season, the animals are too rotten by the time we get them because it doesn't take much in the, in the heat of the summer when a lot of depredation uh, permits are, are being used for those samples to no longer be usable. So there's a lot of factors involved in that. Um, prior to that, there wasn't necessarily, you know, CWD wasn't thought to exist in the Southeast, you know, because the surveillance had been done. Um, it wasn't until Arkansas detected it at a high rate that people realized, well, maybe the surveillance systems we've been using weren't good enough. And that's when TWA started to reevaluate their own surveillance systems as well as most of the other Southeastern states. Um, so in terms of the long-term reason why that wasn't a required sampling, you know, it's, if you don't know the disease is there or even think it should be there, you know, you've got to think it should be there before you start looking for it. And so it's, it's a bunch of different factors involved in it. So that's as best as I can answer it. Somebody else. I'd add to the, the, the question about sampling depredation deer. Is, it, is there a circumstance where we're holding a training for our staff uh, to learn how to uh, collect samples or something like that where we can utilize uh, depredation permit deer? And we certainly do that kind of on a case by case basis where we need to. Um, it comes back, it goes back to like Dan said, the time of the year when it is and it's being able to get to those deer to get them sampled. Um, it's pretty difficult. Um, got a couple more here. How many confirmed cases in Henry County as of today? That's still one. Um, and who pays for testing? And that's TWRA, the state. Hunter will not out anything for uh, having their deer tested. I don't have anything else on I've got one that I can't read, so I'll... <laughs> uh, it's not legible, you mean? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yes, sir. This is where I come in. When you see a sick deer, we pull it, put it down, and let's go. And we, we I would recommend that you harvest it if, you, if you're able to. Um, you know, we'd recommend you use gloves and, and avoid, if you think something's potentially sick, you know, I would, I would, uh, I'd recommend that you use, you know, protective equipment. If not, if you're not able to harvest it, then uh, please contact us or go on our website. You can fill out a sick deer report and we'll get that information um, with the location and the details and everything like that. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, you know, the incentive programs and things, if it's a buck, you can still, even if it's positive buck, as long as you've done all the things to be able to move that head, you can still keep the trophy from that buck even if it's positive. We just don't want that brain material and the skin and everything else necessarily uh, leaving the unit if it doesn't have to. So, and remember, like Dan said, you know, deer that appear sick like that doesn't. There's many different things that can be wrong with them, not just CWD. And you know, many times um, we'll, we'll test. We'll go to a, on a call for a clinical deer, and you know, I know there's many, many times that it, it doesn't come back positive. So we attribute that to one or the other. Diseases, one of the other factors. So. Yeah. yeah, we got another question. Um, it's another one we get a lot, and it's a, it's a good question. Um, if we do take a deer and it is positive, are we not spreading prions through fluid release while dragging out the deer? There's always that potential. Um, the reality is, is if that deer was positive, where you're dragging it, unless you're dragging it 10 miles to get to where your truck is, that deer's probably already spread prions while it was alive in that environment. Um, you know, if you're, if that is a big concern for yours, um, you know, you can always bone it out in the field and leave the carcass where it lays, uh, or bag it and then drag it out in a bag or, or the only ways to kind of prevent that from happening. You know, the, there's, there's the reality of what recommendations we can offer you for preventing the spread. And there's the practicality of actually being able to implement that if you're going to hunt still. Um, and so that's, you just got to find that balance of protecting yourself and protecting the deer herd in and of itself. Um, it's, you know, there's no 100% solid answer to give as this is, this is going to 100% guarantee we don't spread any prions. Um, it's just the reality of that deer has been moving around in that area, urinating and defecating and interacting with the environment already at that point in time. So there's probably already uh, prions that have been deposited in the area. 
obviously. Just a note uh, about the report of sick deer website. Um, that same website that we mentioned where you go to find uh, sampling locations to find your sample results and all the different information that's on there. There's a ton of information on there. I, I would encourage everybody to, to go there. Uh, there is a link also uh, to the report of sick deer. So I wanted to mention that. That's all contained in the same uh, website. Oh, we got more. We got more questions coming. Yeah, this was included on one of the, on that four point question that I didn't ever get to. Uh, have harvest numbers increased in the CWD positive counties? Um, unfortunately, the year after we discovered CWD in uh, Fayette and Hardeman counties, um, the harvest actually decreased. Um, about 30 percent significantly especially um, the doe harvest um, and when you're talking about a disease that's dependent on deer interaction uh, to, to spread and proliferate you know that's that's kind of the worst case scenario for the population to sort of explode uh, due to the uh, decrease in harvest um, since then though I actually looked at the numbers um, about a week or so ago kind of compared um, the, the season right before 28, well, 2017, uh, the, the season right before CWD in those counties, um, you know, we did have the drop immediately after 2019. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty well leveled off, and it's, it's not far off from what, what those guys and, and ladies harvested the year just previous to the CWD. You got another one? You want me to? Yeah, well, it's the second part. Or okay. are hunters killing less because of CWD? Um, scared about not eating them. Um, I'm sure there's some of that. You know, it's, it kind of goes from one extreme to the other as far as everybody's personal, you know, opinion and, and desires about it. There are certainly um, areas of those counties, as Dan mentioned, where the prevalence is is pretty high. So the chances of you killing a positive buck are are pretty good. So. Um, I'm sure there's some uncertainty there with with uh, continuing to harvest deer. Just to, to just to follow up to that, so yep. you are sticking them and burning them. Yep, hunters for the hungry. Um, you can still donate deer through hunters for the hungry hunters for the hungry program. Um, basically, we test. You know, we work with those processors anyways, so we're testing all those deer. Um, the processors, I think, are usually holding them. Test, awaiting test results, and then they're distributed, um, you know, just like normal. Yeah. So Hunters for the Hungry, that program is still operating in um, in all the same counties that it was. Yeah, positive animals don't enter through the Hunters for Hungry program into the into the food chain, basically, because they have the Hunters for Hungry program itself has instituted its own rule of we're not going to allow animals that haven't been tested to enter into the food chain via Hunters for Hungry, if that makes any sense. So that's not anything TWA, TWA took in place. That was a proactive measure that the Hunters for Hungry program actually took in place. Yeah. And many states, actually, most states are that way now. Well, there's um, a little bit of misinformation out there, people thinking that you can no longer, like that, that program's going away or that you can no longer uh, donate. You know, that, that shouldn't be a reason. If that was your, you know, your go-to as far as, least part of your harvest you can still utilize them so yeah and it, again it's not every processor necessarily is right. you got to use the processor that's participating in that right. hunters for hungry program so um if you're going to before you actually go out and harvest an animal if that is your intent make sure the processor you, you're going to take it to actually is in that program so that they they can actually take that animal from you so i do have uh, one other question here um, if you do harvest a, harvest a positive deer, uh, what do you do with the leftover bits that you don't, you know, like the meat that you might have already had processed or, or the packaging? Uh, we recommend burial is the, is the best option at this point in time that we have available for folks um, or disposing of it in regular waste stream, um, household waste stream. Don't feed it to your dog. That's all I got. I think I think with that we'll uh, wrap up the formal portion of the presentation. Well, one question. Can you get it in under the wire?
i check with your processor and and double check but you know from what from what has has been done you know european routes are saved just like just like those and the rest of them and when when one of my staff members or myself come to pick those up on mondays we have european mounts to sample we do that out there on the spot and and put them right back so it's assuming you're not moving it out of uh cwd county you still can't do that you if you live outside of the yeah if you live in henry and it's going to stay in henry you can absolutely if you want it tested it might have to stay there until they get the sample out of it if i think that's what you're getting at yes yeah testing is voluntary Uh, if you look at other, uh, well, if you look at other prion diseases, uh, upwards of 40 years with scrapie that we are aware of, and we're aware of at least 20 to 25 years with CWD in, in affected facilities, and that's mostly from the captive side of things. So what I think we'll do at this point is we'll end the uh, formal portion of the presentation. We'll stick around while everybody's just starting to close up and things so that uh, they can, uh, we can start getting chairs broken down, but we'll still be here to answer questions if you guys uh, still have some questions. So thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Thanks.